On this episode of Sally's Beach Up, I give you a little how-to guide to the hot rod power tour and prep my car, the Green Hornet, for the long haul ahead. some part of the country. Uh, normally you drive about 1,500 miles traveling from seven different cities for seven different days. Uh, it's, it's a pretty grueling trip. It's not quite a vacation. It's more of a challenge, but by far one of the most fun car events ever. I mean, it's incredible how many hot rods are out there cruising the back roads of America with you. And it's just an absolute blast to hang out with like-minded individuals who are sharing in the same hobby as you. And that's what I've always enjoyed about it. I did the long haul last year in the Green Hornet with very minimal issues, but I didn't really prepare my car for the Hot Rod Power Tour. I just kind of went on it. Um, and I'm going again this year, so here's a few simple steps and things to do to your car and how to register and all that for the Hot Rod Power Tour. So first, you want to obviously decide you're going to the Hot Rod Power Tour because it takes commitment. Uh, and once you decide you want to go, you need to register your car. So I waited till the last minute and I just registered my car. Uh, normally, I think if you register prior to June 1st every year, you get a 25% discount rather than just showing up on the day of, which you can register on the day of at the event at any of the locations. You can do single day or multi day registration. A multi day covers the whole week, single day only covers that one day that you're there. Uh, and then you need to book hotel rooms. Uh, that's one of the hardest parts of Power Tours. You have to book hotel rooms early. And luckily I have a good buddy of mine, Tom Zerner, from whatever Hot Rods that really helps me out and books all the rooms and then I change them over to my name. So that's a really good thing that I have going. He's an awesome guy. Uh, but yeah, book all your hotel rooms early because they fill up fast. Hot Rod Power Tour is a massive event that a lot of people show up to. And you want a hotel close to the venue after you've been driving all day because you'll be tired. Trust me. Um, thirdly, you might want to budget for Hot Rod Power Tour because it's quite expensive. For me this year, it's about 6,000 miles uh, overall. And that's almost, that's a little over actually, $1,000 in gas alone for me. Uh, and then adding in hotels and food and whatever little things you have to do to prep your car or taking the time off work, it ends up being a very expensive trip. But it's my vacation. I get to choose what I do on my vacation. This is what I do. All right, so once you've budgeted, and you've booked your rooms, you've registered for Hot Rod Power Tour, you kind of need to go over your route. So for me this year, I'm driving up to San Francisco from Los Angeles where I live, up the PCH in the Green Hornet to meet up with a few buddies of mine who are cruising out to the Hot Rod Power Tour from California. So I'm calling it the Pre and Post Power Tour Cannonball Cruise. It has a nice ring to it, but so I'm driving up the PCH, I'm leaving on the 6th of June, I'm going to meet them and then we're going to cannonball in two days, the 1800 or so miles out to Kansas City from San Francisco. Um, and then the actual Power Tour starts. So my trip before Power Tour is longer than Power Tour than itself and then my trip back is even longer. So yeah, makes sense if you don't think about it. And you can get all the details on the route for Hot Ride Power Tour, the locations, the registration what you should do. There's frequently asked questions section that you can uh, you can look at as a really a big help for people who are doing this for the first time. Once you've done it once, you kind of know how it all goes, but doing it for a first time is a daunting task, I know, uh, because I did it last year. So um, yeah, Hot Rod, you just Google Hot Rod Power Tour 2017 for this year, and it'll bring you up a full page, the first result of all the things that you need to know to be able to go on Hot Rod Power Tour. Um, but once you have everything set, you have your budget, you have your book, your rooms booked, your car registered for Power Tour, and your route planned, you need to prep your car because this is a really, really big trip. And no matter how reliable your car is, you should go over it. Uh, so here's a few simple steps as to 
what you should do to your car. And I'm also gonna go into what I am doing to my car in particular after I looked over it. So yeah, here we go. All right, so as far as prepping your car for Power Tour goes, it's gonna be a little different for, every, for everybody. If you have a brand new car, you're probably not gonna have to do all that much. Maybe change the oil, check the tires, you know, get an alignment, get the wheels and tires balanced. I mean, check your fluids, basically, if you're in a new car. But if you drive an old beater like I do, like this 1972 AMC Hornet Sportabout that y'all all know as the Green Hornet, you gotta do a little more. And it's gonna be different for everybody, like I said. But uh, if your car is kind of just a, a weekend car, you might have to take it for a drive and see what's going on, put it up on a lift or crawl underneath it and poke around and see what's going on and find any issues that you could see. Um, but with my car, I drive it every day, so I pretty much know what's wrong with it and what needs attention and what I can leave alone for now. Uh, so yeah, I'll show you a little bit about what I do when I go underneath a car to figure out what it needs to prep for a road trip like this. Here you go. I'm lucky enough to have access to a lift. If you don't have a lift, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to crawl underneath your car or, or get on a creeper and roll around, and that sucks. But I have access to a lift, so I'm gonna use it. All right, so once you're under your car, you want to kind of do a visual inspection of what's going on with their vehicle. So I noticed looking at the front suspension, which is a very vital part of any car, you can get away with a little bit on the rear, but the front needs to function well and, uh, you know, do exactly what it's supposed to. So my ball joints are both, uh, leaking grease out of the boots and I haven't really felt any issues with them, but I'm going to change them anyway. My tie rod ends, are shot but I don't have money for new tie rod ends because they're actually pretty expensive for this car surprisingly so I'm just gonna grease them as good as I can and roll with it uh, but another thing is my control arm bushings are pretty well ruined uh, top and bottom you can't see the tops down here but I'm gonna put new control arm bushings in on both sides new ball joints all the way on all four uh, top upper and lower control arms on on each side and uh, what else was I gonna do? Oh, I'm putting shocks on all four corners. I'm gonna replace the radiator hoses because this one leaks no matter what I do. Um, other than that, I'm not doing a whole lot uh, up front. Out back, I'm putting air shocks in the back because this thing sags due to the old leaf springs when I have it loaded down. So I'm gonna put some air shocks in here so I can uh, jack the back of the car up as needed. Um, I am going to fix my leaky differential. I already started taking the bolts out before I started this video, but uh, I'm gonna fix my leaky differential. Uh, and I am also going to remove the gas tank and fix what I assume is a pickup tube that has a hole in it because my gas tank runs out with five gallons left in the tank. And that gets annoying on road trips because you know, you gotta fill up more. Uh, but this car, once the gas tank is fixed, will be capable of 400 mile jaunts. So, it should be pretty good. You might notice that the bottom of this car is absolutely filthy. Uh, when I bought it, I had a really, really bad rear main seal leak, and I didn't fix it right away. I drove it cross country uh, from California to Georgia, where I lived at the time, 2200 miles in three days, and I added 28 quarts of oil. 28! Um, so yeah, the bottom of this car still is covered in oil from that trip. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I single-handedly caused an environmental disaster driving this thing cross country. But hey, it made it home. Uh, now it's rebuilt and doesn't really leak that much oil at all. But it's a six-cylinder, so it still leaks. Because these inline sixes, no matter what you do, are always going to leak. It's really annoying. But hey, they'll run forever, so bit of a trade-off oh well anyway let's get to work so I am servicing my differential while fixing the leak uh, yeah it's been leaking for quite some time and I just haven't done anything about it it leaks so slowly that it really doesn't lose fluid um, but there's no drain plug on an AMC 15 rear end so there's just the fill plug so what you do is take all the bolts out 
get a screwdriver and just do that. And then let all the fluid drain out. Once you drain all the fluid out, uh, you'll clean both surfaces of the both the rear end housing and the differential cover. And I'm just going to use gasket sealer because I don't have a gasket yet. So yeah, and then you fill it back up. Pretty easy. I also find that uh, getting a little brake clean, hard to see with the light. Here in California, it's all non-chlorinated. See, 50 state formula. Oh, that's the Spanish side, sorry. Non-chlorinated brake and parts cleaner. 50 state formula. So I get a little brake cleaner and clean out my differential. After you do that, you can see a little bit about how a differential works. That back there, right in there, is your pinion gear. This is your ring gear. So you have your ring and pinion. That's what people are always talking about. And the number of teeth on each in relation to each other determines your gear ratio. This particular diff, as you can tell, is an open differential, not a limited slip or anything. It's just completely open. There's no clutches or anything to lock those uh, those spider gears together that's what these are these in here are your spider gears and it just allows one wheel to spin as you can see this wheel is spinning and i'm still spinning it and that wheel is staying still so yeah open differential not exactly what you want in a performance vehicle but it works these particular gears are 273s and with this big tall jeep tire that i have out here probably like a 250 final drive ratio so this thing does awesome on the highway not so good at the drag strip though oh well let's get back to work all right this right here is a diff cover uh this particular one goes to an amc 15 on my amc hornet and here's what i like to do with these before i put them back on the car this right here is a parts washer a little messy but it works it's got an electric pump on it and it's got heated fluid down in the bottom and you just wash it got a brush attached that shoots uh, this cleaning solution out which is pretty awesome so yeah just clean this up real good I'm actually gonna clean it more than that but that's good enough for showing you so yeah just clean it basically and make it look nice and then I'll move on to the next step all right so once you have it cleaned in the parts washer it should look a little better inside and outside and you want to bring it over to a wire wheel wear safety glasses and gloves and clean off all the old gasket material. you should have a nice clean differential you see how nice that is nice and clean so we're gonna go put this back on the car now all right once you have your differential cover nice and clean like I have right here nice clean surface you want to come in here and scrape all the old material off of the rear end housing sometimes it can be kind of stubborn because it's been on there a long long time so yeah just scrape all that off, clean it up, and on to the next step. Scraping with a hand scraper isn't exactly your speed. You can use one of these to clean off the old gasket material. So that's what I'm about to do because I am slightly impatient. So I just snugged these bolts down and you could see the gasket sealer pressed out around the edges. So now I'm going to move on to dropping my fuel tank and figuring out why it runs out with five gallons in it. So that's next while I wait for that to cure before I add fluid. So I decided to put the camera down and actually get some work done. So air shocks are in, plumbed, 
and then it's gonna run above my gas tank. It runs into the car, then back out where the reverse light light exits the vehicle through a grommet. Um, I filled the diff with fluid and tightened the bolts the rest of the way, so it's good to go. Now I just gotta throw the gas tank back in. I figured out that the, the pickup tube had separated from its mountain was just kind of moving around in there so that's why i was running out before it was actually empty so i soldered it in and then put a whole bunch of rtv to keep this thing from leaking because the seal was kind of old and that thing was leaking a little tiny bit so i rtv'd all around it too and it's ready to go back in so yeah here we go all right so now that i've crossed some items off my list which you should make a list i forgot to mention lists help keep you on track and organized and less overwhelmed and it gives you a feeling of satisfaction every time you get to cross something off. So I put air shocks on the rear, I get to cross that off. I fix my rear diff leak. I fix the gas tank. Partially it's leaking again for some reason, so I gotta look at that. But now I get to move on to fixing the front suspension. So I have the car back on the lift again and I'm gonna tear the whole front, sus front suspension apart and put new bushings on the upper and lower, lower control arms as well as new shocks and ball joints. So should be good to go after that. So yeah, here we go. So here's everything I plan to do to the front end of the Hornet today. I have new control arm bushings, upper and lower, as well as new ball joints, upper and lower, and a new uh, shock for both sides, as well as new spark plugs. I'm waiting on a few other odds and ends to get here for the engine. Nothing major, just doing basic maintenance. So this is what I'm doing today, hopefully provided everything goes well. So yeah, who knew that Moog, our buddy from Mighty Car Mods, owned a suspension and steering company? Not the same guy, but hey, it's a thought that counts, right? Moog Problem Solver. That's what they call these things for some reason. But surprisingly, all this stuff is made in the United States of America, which is pretty crazy. Don't find that much anymore. Pretty cool. All right, let's get to work. So, these are the old shocks that I just pulled off the car. Let me show you what shocks aren't supposed to do. No resistance at all. They are absolute garbage. So luckily I have new ones to put on that won't do that. Can't believe I was driving around with those on there. It's an easy thing to change too. It's laziness. All right. So if you've never worked on front suspension, I'll give you a little basic overview of what's going on here. So right here, you'll either have your rotor and caliper or your brake drum with shoes and everything inside. This one is drum brake, so it has a brake drum with all the moving pieces of the drum contained inside that unit. Uh, this is the hub, with the spindle and everything. And then on the inside, you have an upper ball joint, which is this guy right here. And a lower ball joint, which is this guy down here. You can you can kind of see it right there. And then you have your um, tie rod ends, which control steering. You can see they go in here to what is called the center link, and then out to the idler arm on this side. And on the other side, it connects to the steering box. Uh, and then these are adjusters for setting your toe in and toe out when getting an alignment done. Uh, these are all held on with a castle nut and a cotter pin like this. Same with the ball joints. And then as far as uh, bushings go that I'm going to be replacing, this is your upper control arm right here. It's got bushings in there and in there. And then it's got a lower control arm with a single bushing here. And then this strut rod arm with another bushing there to keep it from moving forward and aft. Um, this one is a coil on top of upper control arm setup, much like a Mustang, where first-gen Mustang would have. And I have to compress this spring in order to get this upper control arm out, which is always a really, really sketchy job. But I have a tool for that. All right, so in order to get your tie rod end off, you want to bend the cotter pin straight like it is now and then get a pair of needle nose or something like that and pull it out just like that. And then you have the cotter pin here. And then you want to get whatever size that guy is. It says at 11 16th. And then you take that nut off, which I should have a ratchet for this, but you'll get the idea. Once you have the nut and 
everything off of your tie rod end, you get a pickle fork like this and a big hammer, and you slide the pickle fork in between the ball joint boot and the actual surface it's mounted to, and give it a few little taps, and it pops right out. And that's a lot easier to do that on a tie rod than on a ball joint, but it's the same exact process. So, yeah, use these, they help. Don't hit the top of the bolt with a hammer, you'll mess up the threads. People do that a lot, and it's not what you're supposed to do. All right, so when you have a coil on top of upper control arm setup like this car is, uh, you have to compress the spring and remove it in order to remove the upper control arm and change the bushings and ball joint in it. So you get a tool like this. Uh, this is a spring compressor that I rented from AutoZone. They have the loan a tool thing where you buy the tool and use it and then you can return it even after you use it. And so I have it hooked here on the lower part of the spring and then there's a metal thing up in here that spreads across the spring and then you turn it from the top with a wrench or ratchet or whatever suits your fancy and compress the spring and pray it doesn't explode in your face because this is a terrifying part of any project. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. Be sure to put some grease or anti-seize on the threads in here or, uh, because you will mess them up. Because this uses a lot of force to do this. So it's not quite loose, it's almost loose. Just a little bit more. Really still not loose. It's always terrifying. <laughs> and yeah, if it falls out, sometimes the, the compressor will explode like that. And then you'll have to compress it to put it back in. So now I hope I can compress it in the right spot to where it'll pop into place. Yeah, always sketchy. You saw how the last side went. Uh, the spring kind of fell out and the spring compressor compressor exploded off of it and kind of scared Amy as she was filming. And sorry about that. But this is how it's supposed to go, which is still terrifying because there is so much potential energy in this compressed spring that you really don't want to point these two ends at anything important. Like it's pointing at my car right now, which kind of is not the smartest thing, but don't point it at yourself, that's for sure. If this thing were to let go, something would fly out of this end or this end, depending on what broke. So you wanna be very careful with these, and I'm just gonna leave this one compressed so I don't have to compress it again before it goes back on the car, but I'm gonna set it far, far away so it can't do anything to hurt us. But yeah, it's like holding death in your hands, which is kinda of terrifying. But that's how it's supposed to go, not like that other one. Everybody knows disc brakes are better. The Hornet has four-wheel drum brakes, no power assist. So that's like leg day every day you drive this car. Uh, some of the downsides to having drum brakes is that they heat up and don't cool down quickly. So if you're on a steep grade or something, you're going to have a lot of brake fade and they're not good on a track, that's for sure. Uh, also, all of your brake dust stays inside the drum. So whenever you work on them, this is what your hands look like. They just get filthy. Uh, so yeah, I have everything apart, uh, broke both ball joints loose with my pickle fork. You can kind of see what happens here. So you have a spring up here on top that sits down in this perch. And as you hit a bump in the road, it compresses there and you have a shock that goes through that spring. And then on the lower side, you have a single bushing control arm with a strap rod to keep it from moving forward and backwards. And then this is your spindle and everything, assembly your hub basically. And that's how it all works. And so there's just three bolts I have to take out as well as take these little bolts out of the strut rod. Then I can pull these out, press the bushings out and press new ones in and slap it all back together. Okay, so once you have everything broken loose and your spindle and hub and everything separate from your control arms, you need to come in here whiteout works and mark the cam bolt on your lower control arm because it determines your alignment and that's a pretty important thing so you want it to go back to where it was so that you can drive it until you have time to get an alignment done so yeah i use some white out and just mark two little spots so i can put it right back where it was when i'm done putting new bushings in so yeah then you take it apart so once you have your control arms out you can see 
how bad these bushings are. They aren't supposed to move at all. You can hear that one actually moving and I could spin both sides. And you could see it was so bad that it was actually rubbing on the metal of the control arm here. Unfortunately, I can't find this bushing anywhere. It's like the spring perch bushing, but it seems pretty solid. It doesn't move even though it looks bad on the outside. Rubber goes all the way through. And to get ball joints out, they're actually riveted in from the factory. So you're gonna have to come in here and grind these rivets down with a grinding wheel or cutoff wheel or something just to get this thing out and then you bolt in new ones. So I'm gonna clean these up, press the bushings out on both of them. They're both pretty awful and get these ball joints out and put new ones in and we'll be good to go. Once you have your control arm out and cleaned up a little bit where you can see what you're doing, uh, you want to get a death wheel or a ziz wheel or whatever you want to call it with either a grinding disc, a cutoff wheel or like a flap disc and you want to grind down these rivets that are holding this ball joint on. There's two on this one and four on this one and so you want to come in, grind those two guys off, and then you'll replace the with the new ball joint and bolts where the rivets used to go. So, yeah. Oh, and always wear gloves and safety glasses, even if you're wearing shorts. No, makes sense if you don't think about it. down this is just one side you're going to grab some sort of punch and come in here where it's riveted you'll be able to see a faint circle where the rivet is it's really hard to see on this one but once you crack it you can actually see the actual little ring where the rivet is right there yeah you can see it right there so you put your punch on there Give it a couple good whacks and then you'll really be able to see it. And you'll just knock that out on both sides. And it'll fall right out. So yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and grind the other side and then I'll show knocking it out. Again, you should be able to see where it's at. It's very faint, but you can still see it. If you give it a couple good taps, you'll really be able to tell where it's at. Your vice will stay tight. Need to grab a smaller punch where you can see where it's starting to come out. just fall out and then you'll bolt your new one in through those holes that are already there and you can throw the old one in the trash because it's junk ball joints honestly weren't in terrible shape but figured change them while I'm in there so yeah now we got to find the right things to be able to push this bushing out once you have your ball joint removed and uh, you need to push out your control arm bushings. Using a press helps. You can use a vise if you don't have access to a press. You just find the right combination of things to where you'll be able to push that bushing out of the control arm. This is my first try. Don't know if it's going to work on this one, but we're going to see what happens. Okay. All right. Sometimes you got to get a little creative. So these stamped steel control arms have a hollow spot. They're just basically folded over steel, so they like to collapse on themselves. So I put these little shims in here, and then this is going to sit over the outside of that bushing, and I'm gonna push it through from the top, in theory. Alright, 
So, put some lube on it, and that might help as well. And we'll see if we break it or if we get the bushing out. Looks like we're getting just the middle out right now. Yeah, so just the middle's coming out so far. Let's go ahead and get the middle out and then worry about the rest. Looks like it moved some though. Uh, fiasco. appropriate in the garbage <laughs> there we go not easy but it's out such a pain in the butt a little easier than I expected Just like that. New bushings in. It's not easy. Alrighty. Well, it's about 2.15 in the morning. Just wrapped up the front suspension on the Green Hornet. Had to fight those bushings and those control arms like crazy. I mean, it was an absolute pain in the butt. Uh, ball joints went in easy, so that wasn't an issue, but I spent hours on those bushings. I mean, it was just ridiculous. The hardest ones I have ever dealt with in my entire life. But they're on the car, it's back on the ground, everything's tight, and I'm about to go home, get a few hours sleep, and then be right back here tomorrow morning for work. So, yeah. Amy's passed out in the... Uh, in the car you can see her right there <laughs> um, managed to give her a little welding lesson actually while we were in the middle of this which is pretty cool spring compressor exploded multiple times somehow I didn't get hit or hurt at all um, really hard to put the springs back in the car but hey there it is one more step to being power tour ready it's time to go to bed Once you've gone through your car and made sure it is power tour ready, you want to pack for the trip. And that sounds a lot simpler than it is because when you're on a trip like this, if something goes wrong, you need to have it in the car and ready to go when that issue arises. So what I do is I bring a big old box of just miscellaneous useful stuff. Anything from your uh, lubricants and PV blaster, automatic transmission fluid. I'm gonna bring spare oil and coolant, as well as a fire extinguisher, because if you ever have a fire, you wanna be able to put it out. Um, and in this box is anything from a bunch of spare hardware and hose clamps and stuff, including hardware for my drum brakes. I have giant hose clamps in case I have to put something back together that breaks. I even have a spare water pump down in here. Uh, of course, funnel and towels, spare uh, throttle cable in case the, the nice low car one I have on the car breaks, tire plug kit, just miscellaneous brackets, screws, vacuum plugs. In this box is a bunch of RTV uh, and uh, I think I have some spare brake parts for my uh, wheel cylinders in case they go out. Um, additionally, I have more stuff for my brakes should they fail, so I have two brand new wheel cylinders in there as well as a brake hardware kit uh spare spark plugs in case they get fouled out spare belts bunch of fuel line and vacuum hose 
uh, as well as brake hoses because I've had those explode or clog up to where they don't work and it's nice to have those handy. Um, but that's just basically your box that you go to if there is any kind of issues. So, so zip ties, duct tape, all that good stuff that's going to fix your car on the side of the road. Um, but as far as comfort goes, you want to have a big cooler full of ice cold whatever you like to drink. Keep it stocked, keep it full of ice, and you'll thank me later for that one. Uh, chairs for sitting around your car or with, ever, with whoever you're hanging out at the venues. Uh, I like to bring walkie-talkies, actually. These are like a cheap set from Walmart, but they work. Uh, to talk to people in my group and kind of keep you up to date on what's going on. I also bring quick detailer as well as microfiber towels to be able to clean my windows and stuff off. Um, and if you want to record the trip like I do and take a lot of pictures, I bring my, my camera. These are Wayland's cameras that I use kind of as GoPros in the car. And I do time lapses and stuff and it just it's a great way to capture the entire trip because there will be a video on that. And so as a result, I bring my backpack full of my laptop, uh, external hard drive, spare batteries, bunch of charging cables and stuff. And that way I can get everything handled. And yeah, this is kind of just the start of my kit. I have more in the car. Uh, of course you want to bring a spare tire, a jack, um, just basic stuff, jumper cables, ratchet straps, all that good stuff. So. Yeah, a lot of stuff to bring, but it's nice to have it in case you need it. Like I, my dad always used to say, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So that's kind of the logic on prepping for power door. Yeah, there you go. Another thing you always want to have with you, which I mentioned upstairs, is a spare tire, because if you ever have a blowout, you don't want to be stuck waiting for tires, so yeah. Keep a spare tire in the trunk of your car and that's what's right here but one little trick the hornet has is that it has this false floor in the back that's full of more useful items so i have a little tool kit right here i have jumper cables i have a bunch of spare wiring and stuff like that i even have my old ignition system in here so distributor coil wires all that stuff in case the msd system goes out uh so then there's a bunch of wiring kits there's jack stands there's a jack right underneath there zip ties ratchet straps spare radiator hose brake fluid gear oil just a whole bunch of stuff just in case you need it because you never know what's gonna break i even have a timing light in here because why not another thing that's hugely important if anything goes wrong at night you want some kind of flashlight so I have this little lantern thing that I bring along on my road trips that helps a lot. Yeah. And for reliability, of course, you install nitrous on your car because that's smart. As for prep on the inside of the car, generally I just clean it. I just make it nice and clean in here. Not a whole bunch of extra stuff. You see there's some stuff sitting on the seat, but that'll be gone. Um, I just keep it nice and tidy inside because road trips are much nicer when it's clean. Uh, that's something I have definitely found to be true time and time again. Um, as far as tools go, you see there are no tools in my car right now because all my tools are at work. But I will have a fully equipped toolbox in the back of this car ready for anything that might happen. So I bring pretty much everything I have that's standard. I bring some metric stuff in case I have to help people, but my car is all standard SAE stuff. So I bring ratchets, wrenches, ratchet wrenches, sockets. I even bring an impact and a drill and stuff like that, just in case something goes wrong. That way you're prepared for any eventuality. So yeah, bit of an overview of what I do to get ready. And now I'll answer some of you guys' questions that you had about what you should do to get ready for Power Door. Okay, so I wanted to get some of you guys' questions, so I put up a post on Instagram and had you ask me what things might be concerning you about what parts you should take, what hotels you should stay at, and how this, this whole thing, this Power Door works. So I'm going to answer a few of those now. Uh, 
My buddy Malachi, Kai's Toys, asked, how many spare parts should you really take? Now, that's a good question, but it really is dependent upon what you're driving. Like if you're driving something that's super common, like an old Camaro with a small block Chevy, you're going to be able to find parts at any auto parts store for it. So wherever you break down, you're only a few miles from the parts you need. But if you're in a car like mine, like a 1972 AMC Hornet Sportabout, you can't really find parts for that thing. You have to order them. So it really depends on what kind of car you have and how available parts are when you do break down or if you do break down. And if you're driving a modern car, which is totally okay, a lot of people bring late model stuff that they don't have to worry about at all. Um, you don't really need to bring anything. So yeah, it is okay to bring those cars on power tour. A lot of people do wonder about that. You can bring new cars. It is a lot about the old cars, but new cars are definitely welcome. And that leads me to my next question where somebody asked, let's see, who was it? Edmund Welty asked, are imports allowed on the Hot Rod Power Tour? And yes, they are. Any car is welcome. There's a lot of people that actually fly into whatever the state is that Power Tour is starting in and rent a car and drive a rental on Power Tour. While that's kind of not as fun as taking your own car, you could bring anything. So Hondas and all that stuff, definitely welcome. Let's see, what else do we have? Yeah, Cook's Exploration asked, is there an age requirement for cars? And there is definitely not. You can bring whatever you want. And he also asked, how willing are people to help you when you break down? That's one of the really cool parts about Power Tour is that a lot of people will pull over and ask you if you need anything, if you are parked on the side of the road for any reason. Um, like riding with the guys from Roadkill, we ended up on the side of the road quite often. And we had a ton of people stop and ask. Granted, that might be because of who they are. But generally, yes, if you do break down, people will stop and help. And there's a lot of really knowledgeable people. So generally, you'll get going pretty quick. Uh, my buddy Lester Scruggs asked, what is the best hotel chain to wrench on your ride at? And he said, this is valuable power tour information. And I agree, it is valuable information. And really, it's whatever hotel you're at. Just don't ask permission, just do it. What are they gonna do? That's my take on that. I worked on my car in a lot of hotel parking lots and never got bothered. Somebody asked, are shirts and shoes required? Uh, that's J.S. Briggs. Um, I don't think they're required. I mean, whatever you're comfortable in, but I definitely recommend a shirt because it's really sunny on Power Tour and you will get sunburned. So bring sunscreen and wear a shirt for sure. K.L. Prestia, he says, I saw packages sold by Hot Rod are those required or is it more like entering your car and planning your own accommodations along the way? Uh, the packages that Hot Rod offer are really nice because they include your hotel. They even include lunches and stuff as well as registration for your car for the event. Um, they're really nice, but they're also very expensive. Uh, so if you can get away with just doing the normal registration, that's what I do. And booking your hotels early, you'll get a much better deal than if you let Hot Rod do it for you because you are paying them to do that for you. Um, a lot of people that I know, to save money, they even camp or sleep in their car and shower at truck stops and stuff. I personally don't recommend it because after that long day of driving, you kind of want to just have a nice place to relax and the hotel is very good for that. But if you're on a budget, you can definitely camp or sleep in your car and just make do with what you have. I even have another buddy who drives 20 miles or so from the venue towards the next stop and gets a hotel because there's always stuff available outside of the cities where Power Tour is at. I get this one a lot when people are asking me about Power Tour. Uh, MWNS, basically, it's a long question, but he basically asked, are people trying to get their best times when they're racing at Power Tour or are they just there for the trip? Um, and I think a lot of people get Drag Week at Power Tour mixed up. Power Tour is more about the road trip. Yes, there is autocross and drag racing at each individual venue, depending on what kind of track you're at. Um, but it's definitely not about the racing. It's more about the road trip and getting to see back road America and with a bunch of friends and hot rods around. So it's definitely not about getting your best time. It's more about enjoying the trip. So yeah, drag week though, that's all about getting the best time and lots of people break stuff as a result. On Power Tour, you don't wanna break your car. That's no fun. So Gon's Turbo Ranger asked, how much does one save up to do that road trip on average? Uh, that really depends on how budget oriented you want it to be. Like I said, you can sleep in your car or you can camp, um, but 
and it also depends on how much you're driving. So for me from California this year, I have to drive something like 6,000 miles around the trip, so my gas bill is over $1,000. Uh, last year I spent well under $2,000. This year it's going to be a hair over $2,000, but that includes prep of the vehicle. So it's kind of an expensive trip, but you can do it cheaper if you live close to the venue and you don't mind sleeping in your car to save money. So, yeah. Uh, another really good question from my friend New American Vintage uh, basically asked, how, what kind of roads is Power Tour on? Is it on highways or is it on back roads? And he's really interested because his C10 is great at between 55 and 65 miles an hour, but anywhere above 70, it's a little much for that car. You'll be turning a lot of RPM. Um, that's a really good question. And the best part about Power Tour is most of the time you are on back roads and you're pretty much just cruising along at 40 or 50 miles an hour. So it's really good for our cars, especially those of us who do not have overdrive on our transmission um, for not turning a whole bunch of RPMs and just enjoying the drive. There are parts of Power Tour that do end up on the highway, but if you can run 65, you're totally fine and you're not going to have any issues. It's really the trip to and from Power Tour where not being able to run higher speeds is going to hurt you because I have to drive something like 2,400 miles to get to Power Tour. So yeah, I can run 80 all day with no issues. Granted, I'm going to be with some friends of mine. We're probably going to run about 70, so it's really the trip there and back that being able to cruise on the highway matters. The rest of it, you're going to be on back roads and you'll be totally fine. Overall, Power Tour is an amazing event that I really don't ever want to miss out on because it's so much fun and there's such a great group of people there. And that's one of the best parts about Power Tour is you make friends that you're going to come back and see every year. So if you can go and get your car ready, I definitely recommend it. And I don't think you'd regret going on it. So I hope to see some of you guys there and I hope this video helped in some way. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and follow along at jrossdavis underscore photography on Instagram. Thanks guys.